Okay, this is part two of the Gardens All interview with Roger Lenhart of Norm's Farms. I'm Leora Alderson, GardensAll.com, and Coleman Alderson, husband and wife. Well, I wanted to start off on this, uh, this part of the video asking Roger about when he started off in Missouri to plant these uh, elderberry bushes, it seemed like that was more like a, a permanent way to deal with all the soil erosion that was happening with every flood. And Roger, you mentioned that um, now when it floods, what happens is the elderberries actually trap the silt and retain the soil, which is fantastic. Um, but I'm wondering why it is that, it, was there a, a continual sort of chain of discoveries about, hey, this is not only a great permaculture type plant, but it has a great uh, value as a food. It has a great thing for you know, added value type products. Tell us more about why you actually focused in on elderberries. That's a great question, Coleman. Um, again, you know, with the permanent perennial agriculture desire there with the property, I was really intrigued by how we could get away from that annual tillage. Um, the other big factor in why we decided to grow elderberry, our farm is located in close proximity to Columbia, Missouri, where the University of Missouri is located. Mm -hmm. In the mid to late 90s, the University of Missouri started what was known as the Elderberry Improvement Project. Mm -hmm. You can actually read about that on our resources tab on the on the Our Story tab on our webpage. But the Elderberry Improvement Project was really set up by the university as a land grant university to come up with alternatives and different things that Midwestern farmers could do to bring a little bit of income diversity to the farm. So what they did was they reached out to growers all over the United States and Canada to get different varieties and different cultivars of the different um, known species of elderberry in that were mostly the Nordic, Nordic, native um, North American varieties of Canadensis, but there were also some of the European varieties of the Sambucus nigra in that study. And what they found after doing all the phenology and the growing of them out, they looked at yield, they looked at berry size, things like juice to mass ratio of the elderberries, and they literally found that there were about six of the 65 different varieties they studied that showed what we call as having the most commercial potential. And what's that, what's that mean? Well, we want large yield. First and foremost, if we're going to grow something, we want big yield. You know, that's where we're going to get the best payout. So we want that, but we also want quality of fruit. We want, you know, plants that are dark, deep, and robust in, the, in, the, in their ripening tendencies. Mm -hmm. We want the berries to all uniform ripely, uh, evenly. Uh, the berries form in clusters, and we don't want, you know, green berries on the outer margins go into red with only the purple berries in the center. We want that whole cluster to be purple mm -hmm. with ripe, uniform berries. And we also want large yield of juice. If we're going to be processing these berries, we don't want little tight berries with no juice in them. We want plump, juicy berries. We also want disease insect resistance. We want drought tolerance, you know, especially for those Midwestern growers. So those were all the considerations that they looked at when they started studying the elderberry. Did they so, in, uh, uh, Roger, did they plug in sugar content as well? Like they do? Well, that's important too. It absolutely is important. And we measure the sugar content of the berries through a little device called a refractometer. It's literally a little device with a slide on it and a lens and you put a little juice on that thing and you hold it up to the light and it literally gives you a break between the color at a scale that you can read and it tells you the water soluble um, sugars in that liquid. Wow. And so we can do these field tests. We do that when we're picking to, to make sure we're getting ripe berries. Well, um, and so that's like, really important too. It sounds a little bit like what we've done you know, with from finger to mouth with the blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. We call that the you know the taste test. Uh, with elderberries, you know, you got to be a little careful with the elderberries because they do have some toxicity to the seed. Uh, that's why elderberries are never seen fresh anywhere. They're very perishable. Mm -hmm. They don't last very long at all. So when you pick them in the morning, unless you're going to process them that afternoon, you either need to chill them to process them the next day, or you freeze them to process them weeks or months later. Okay, so, so it's very important. You're growing is the Sambucus nigra. 
Yeah, so everything we grow is the Sambuca Snyder, and we work closely with the University of Missouri to adopt their system. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the spacing and the alleys in between, using all those cover crops in our alleys and growing that elderberry like a dense hedge, we really learn this system from the University of Missouri. Are you planning on, uh, on uh, like, built up rows or like a raised bed type situation or are you just going directly into the ground? At ground? Well, we did a, a lot of different things along the way. We did use a plastic weed barrier based on the recommendation of the university. We checked with uh, OMRI, you know, our Organic Materials Resource Institute mm -hmm. to make sure it was okay to use black plastic. Uh, and we planted a lot of elderberries starting out in a very robust black plastic of eight mil. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that's too robust. Uh, <laughs> literally stop the elderberries from coming up where you want them. They just right. spread their root system outside the plastic. And then all the elderberries come up out in the alleys. So we found the hard way that that was a mistake. Okay. Another thing that we found out after the fact is that in order to be certified, the black plastic needs to be removed every year. Oh. So we created a nightmare. Yeah. That we unknowingly didn't know about. So after we figured that out, then any future plantings after that, we went to a biodegradable plastic that would only last about a year. Go Roger, ahead. When you, I'm sorry. When you say um, in order to be certified, do you mean organic or do you mean as a... To get organic certified, you can't leave the plastic in the soil. Okay. Yeah. So moving forward, because that's important to us and we want to get that certification, we ripped out all the old plastic. And then when any new plantings, we went to a much less robust, a one mil biodegradable. It's based on a corn starch, you know, so it doesn't last very long in the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does stop a lot of the perennial weeds that first year. Really the best thing you can do for a good stand of, of elderberries and, and weed prevention is just what I, what I just said, a really good stand of elderberries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. The denser your elderberries are, the less problem you're going to have with weeds. Okay, so yeah. speaking of density, I think we touched on this in the first video, uh, but could you give us like a schematic idea of um, acreage and trees? I think you mentioned the spacing planting earlier, so if you could just recap on that. Sure. So again, with the university system, what they originally had us do was put our rows 12 feet apart and put those cuttings four feet within those rows, which we did. The thing we found out about that spacing is it takes quite a while for those clumps to grow together. The first year, you know, you have that single cutting. The next year, three, four stems come up. The next year, 10, 12. The next year, you may have 20 stems. Well, even three years later with 20 plus stems at every planting, you still have a big patch in between those clumps that can come up in weeds and yep. tree seedlings and all that kind of stuff. And we found out that that was a real nightmare trying to keep that space in between the clumps clear mm -hmm. so then because we had more plant material and we could produce our own nursery stock from our own orchard then we started putting those cuttings much closer we've gone with cuttings as as close as 12 inches apart yeah. we have 18 inches we found that the 20 to 24 inch is really the best because that'll give them plenty of opportunity to grow when they come back with three to four stems and then and the next plant with three to four stems comes back you know they're about a foot from their base and so literally within that first two years you've already established that dense hedge growth nice. and roger do you do you alternate varieties our understanding is it's well we've kept all our varieties within the row so if we did one row we tried to make everything in that row the same variety uh-huh okay and then the next row over might be a different variety. Yeah, we might do a block of four or fives of the Wildwood, then a block of four or five of the Ranch, another four or five of the Adams. So we have about six mm -hmm. varieties that we grow. They're, and, they're, uh, they're different varieties. Yeah, we get those in blocks. They're, they're different varieties, but they're all the Sambucus nigra. Is that right? No, they're not nigra. They're Sambucus canadensis. The nigra is the European species. Okay. In the uh, university studies, they found through all the different test plots. Um, they worked with the University of Illinois. They worked with uh, two test plots down in Southern Missouri, Mount Vernon and Pilot Grove. 
They also worked with the University of Oregon out in Corvallis. And what they found in all the various, also Minnesota, and Lincoln University too, there's five or six test bites throughout the, the country that they grew these varieties out. The only ones where the Niagara did any kind of um, success in the trials was out in Oregon. But in the Midwest trials, Illinois, um, Missouri trials, the Minnesota trials, the uh, Niagara varieties just did not perform well at all. In fact, many of them died. Hmm. Well, if you think about Europe and its climate, uh, the west coast of our continent is much closer to, you know, the European continent's climate. You know, you look at the Midwest and here in, in the south, I mean, we get hot, we get dry, we have a lot of rain in the summertime, which is not necessarily ideal. Um, without good ventilation, you know, you spread fungus and all kinds of things, you know, and, and if a plant's not used to that environment, you know, the, the, the wetness of our southern climate here in the summer can ruin a lot of uh, European species. They just won't grow well here. And in the Midwest, you know, high susceptibility to drought, that's a condition that the Niagara can't tolerate at all. Right. Okay. So, and pardon, because I'm just a newbie at this, in terms of the different varieties then, are they also, do you also need the different varieties for the cross-pollination? Well, you know, that's what a lot of nurserymen will tell you, and even a lot of people in the know who are well-meaning will tell you that. Um, it's a myth. The reality is, is every one of these species that we grow, they're actually varieties, the species of Sambucus canadensis, with the variety name being a local cultivar you know we term we term that kind of we use that term loosely so the bob gordon as an example was found in an osceola indian encampment mm -hmm. so we believe the native population of the osceola indians recognize this one for some of its favorable properties the same things we look for they would look for plump juicy berries high yielding large uniform you know uh, Bob Gordon hangs downward. The birds don't eat it quite as much, you know, so that's another trait that's very favorable. So this variety was selected, and it's kept true to its parentage through vegetative propagation. So when we take a cutting off of a plant, it makes an identic genetic clone of itself. Elderberries are very similar to apples in that with apples, if you grow apple, a red delicious as an example and it has 16 seeds in it it'll produce 16 apple trees and every one of those apple trees will probably produce some fruit but not a single one of those fruits will be like a red delicious mm -hmm. yeah. right right the way we keep the red delicious that was found in a farmer's field in 1850 is we propagate it vegetatively we make a clone of that same wild fence row wild del delicious apple that sprouted on its own nobody planted it Nobody grew it. Nobody tended it. They don't know how it got there. It but we keep that apple through, through vegetative propagation. So that's the same thing that we're doing with elderberries. So back to your question. Do they need a cross-pollinator? No. And the reason being, if I said you needed a Bob Gordon to pollinate a wildwood and a wildwood to populate a ranch, I would be saying, well, you need a Sambucus canadensis to pollinate a Sambucus canadensis because they're all Sambucus canadensis. I see. Okay. And then the other thing is, is we have wild elderberries growing everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So even if you're just growing one variety, chances are the pollen's going to come in on the wind or the native pollinators, mm -hmm. and, that, and that elderberry is going to get pollinated. The other thing about the elderberry is it has a variety of pollinators, and none of which are the honeybee. Wow, interesting. People always say, well, you know, I've got, I want to grow some elderberries because I raise bees. Right. And I said, well, great, but you're not going to get elderberry honey. Bees don't like because the flowers, huh? The flowers are tiny. They're made up of clusters, and there can be 1,000, 1,500 of them in a cluster. And they're no bigger than the size of a pencil eraser. They're tiny. They're about a quarter inch in diameter. The hole down inside the flower is very, very small. If you look at the honeybee, he's got a really large mouth. <laughs> There's no way he can get the pollen out of an elderberry. Interesting. So it's more like smaller insects are very, very tiny pollinators, like some of the pollinating wasps. People see these things, and they don't know what they're looking at, but a, but a pollinator wasp is no larger than a gnat. Hmm. Wow. And unless your eyes are really good, you would never know that you're looking at a wasp. Wow. 
Yeah, and they have a long slender proboscis, right? Uh -huh. right? The other thing is, is we see insects like the lightning bug that frequent the elderberry. Oh, nice. We see stink bugs, you know, the smelly shield-looking bug. They're yeah. all over the elderberries. Uh -oh. Well, they have small legs, and as they walk across the, the elderberries, the legs potentially may be going down into the flowers, and they transfer pollen that way through their legs. Mm -hmm. okay. Do they pick up on butterflies? With the uh, we don't see a lot of butterflies on them. Yeah. No. So, do, do, no. well, that brings another question, and that is, therefore, do the flowers tend, the elderberry flowers, the elder flower tend to attract more of the stink bug population? You know, I don't know that they attract more. I think the thing that's going on more than anything is there is an opportunity for life to flourish. Yeah. You know, uh, did you see the stink bugs in the in the soybeans? Not that I was ever aware of. No. <laughs> you know, um, but I see them on other things, not just the elderberry. You know, we get them in the squash all the time. Right. When you go out into the orchard now, you know, you go down in the evening when the sun's low and it's just alive. There's literally insects flying around everywhere. You can see their wings. You know, in the in the low level light in the evening then you've got larger predatory insects swooping down eating those insects the swallows in the evening you know you can have 70 80 swallows moving in and out of the fields and those guys are the big predators you know they're swooping down eating even the bigger insects the other thing we see is a huge huge population of tens of thousands of dragonflies and a dragonfly is another good sign of the eco you know ecological health they're another predatory insects. They won't be there if they don't have insects to eat. That's a great point, yeah. Okay, so um, you're back to like if growing it. Um, sorry, I lost my thought actually. Did you have one? Well, <laughs> looks like we've covered the mechanics of that. And then um, I guess getting back to the originating question, other aspects of the elderberry that, uh, okay, you learned how to grow it, but toward what end? And we've on our on our website have found a great interest in everything from making tea to using the the flowers to fry up, you know. Um, oh, to, I, I remember my question. Can okay, I jump go ahead. In? Because go ahead. we'll pick up on recipes and products and added value um, products that you were talking about. But the question had to do with when you mentioned the Garden Zell community. So the the problems people have had um, are the the and the questions. You know, can they be eaten raw? And, you know, and we've touched on that, but we haven't elaborated on it. So from our research, sir, um, it's showing that our internet connection is unstable. Are you, get, are you still catching us, Robert? I mean, Roger? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting you fine. It's, okay. uh, it's pretty easy to understand. Okay, good. Okay, so from our research, um, we understand that certain varieties, one variety, and I believe it's Sambucus nigra, right. is okay raw um, as long as the berries are ripe, fully ripe but the rest should not well, be. No, that's not well. necessarily true. Okay. No, the, the, the reason why you don't eat a lot of elderberries, there's a couple reasons. Um, the seed itself, like apple seed, pear, peach, has precursor cyanide in it. Oh, yeah, so yeah. you don't want to eat apple seeds either, but they're easy to avoid. You just simply don't eat the core. The peach pit is huge, very easy to avoid. With the elderberry, they can have more than one seed. So every elderberry has a seed. It's impossible to eat them and not eat the seeds. If you crush the seeds by chewing them and you release that, toxins, those toxins can actually create expulsionary kind of reactions. In other words, we could potentially have uh, really bad, severe diarrhea as a result of it. If we eat enough of them, it can even cause vomiting. So no, you never eat elderberries raw. Okay. We juice them in our mouth when we're in the field, like we were talking about with the blueberries, like you like to do, do that taste test. Yeah. We'll juice them in our mouth. In other words, we taste them, we be very careful to avoid crushing the seeds, and then we spit out what we don't want. Okay. Right? So that's how we do it in the field. The other property about elderberry is it's a mild laxative. So even when the stuff has been processed, you want to do this in small dosages, and that's why with our elderberry extract, the recommended serving is uh, one teaspoon. So we get about 30 to 
eight to 40 servings in an eight ounce bottle. The reason we don't make what's known as an elderberry juice, the consumer in large part because of our agricultural and food safety guidelines believes rightfully so that juices are in four to eight ounce servings. That's why we have a little four ounce juice glass. People are used to that. If you drank four ounces of elderberry juice, I guarantee you, you would not be real pleased if you didn't already expect that that laxative property is going to kick in because in small doses, it's mild. In large doses, it becomes powerful. If you drank eight ounces of elderberry juice, it's like a colon cleanse. It will <laughs> literally create total evacuation. Wow. Yeah. So that's long, long story to your answer, which is part of the reason why you create these value added products. Well, for us, we also recognize that, yeah, the supplement world is great, but not everybody can afford that. So we also felt like it was important to create a consumer line in the general grocery aisle. And that's how we came up with the idea of doing first an elderberry jelly that we made from the pure extract. The elderberry jam is made from the whole fruit with no seeds. The elderberry ginger pecan is just that same dram dressed up and spiced up with ginger and fortified with a little protein in the form of the pecan, a native, you know, mm -hmm. um, North Carolina pecans we use in that recipe. And then the final recipe is the blueberry elderberry preserves. North Carolina grows a lot of blueberries yeah. and we can source the blueberries very readily from our growers down east. And we've combined fresh whole frozen blueberries in that recipe with our elderberry jam. Because it's got the whole blueberries in there, there will be some of the small tiny blueberry seeds. So that's why that product is labeled as a preserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's mentioned the flowers. We've also got a brand new product that we just created called an elderflower syrup. And then we have an elderflower syrup with ginger. Those are in the prototype stage. And right now we have a label design. We have small samples that we're getting out of the building with and sharing with people and getting feedback on it before we actually do a full blown launch of that product. We've also got a children's formula that we've got that's going to be coming out this fall as well. And that's our elderberry extract simply combined with blueberry to reduce that dosage. So when a mom wants to give a child, you know, a dose of elderberry, she's not giving them too much. She can still use the full teaspoon, give them the right level of elderberry they need without kicking in that laxative property, but combining it with a sweeter fruit like blueberry that children love. So we think that's going to be a real big hit. That's awesome. So, so now we're verging in on the uh, curative powers the uh, health benefits. Yeah, but can we? Do you have? Let's, a, let, let's. Can we do that in part three? I think. I mean, okay, this is. We sure. could talk to you all day. This is. Yeah, so this much is fun. So we talk about the third part or something. Yeah. Part, what's that? You, so we're gonna do like three part video. We'll, yeah. Well, we'll I mean, it was supposed. Properties of elderberry as the third part. Yeah, I was thinking actually the third part will be like your products and the properties exactly. But right Good. now we're still coming from the growing side. So right. if we could kind of complete the picture and then we will actually pick back up with that. We might end up actually in four parts. And if we can't do it all today, then we'll pick up with when we can, because we're not going to get deep into the finances of it um, during this growing part. We're going to be talking about that later on, but okay. to give an idea. So we've talked about your ideal scenario spacing is two feet apart. Um, and you know, what's like, imagine the template you said, how many acres are you growing currently in Missouri? Well, there's a, another great story there. They were, we started out with the first planting of an acre and a half. And from there we spread out. We actually at one point had as much as 30 acres planted. We tried over anxiously to grow a lot of elderberries, thinking that we would be better farmers than we are. <laughs> we also, as farmers, did not know we were gonna experience two of the hottest, driest years in the Midwest. And during those two years, we lost lots of cuttings. Um, so we reduced our orchard much smaller to something that we could manage but in the process of growing out elderberries and raising awareness about elderberries we kind of unknowingly helped other farmers get started growing elderberries and we found that many of the farmers are better growers than we are so while we do still grow elderberries on our farm we do now purchase the majority of our elderberries from other small farmers. Okay, fantastic, which is, which is part of the exciting part of this interview and story. Well, one of the many, and that is that you are a resource 
for people who are interested in growing elderberries, either like you said, in their backyard for their serving their own family, or even as a part of farming for profit. Um, so what would, if you could give us a, just a broad stroke idea, let's say that, and because we actually, as we talked with you earlier offline, are interested in, in considering what crop we might want to grow on acreage that we have. Um, okay. And one of those crops that we're seriously considering is elderberry. So if we have, we have 50 acres, but not all of it's open and it's on a hillside. Um, so if we were to consider growing elderberry on, let's say two acres, um, that's on a hillside. Does that sound like you know a prospect that um, that's worth looking into? That's worth considering. Well, it is. Um, the elderberry does have a lot of value as far as growing them on a slope. We do have a grower up in Leesville, Virginia, and she's done just that. Most people tend to grow on a slope by putting the plants on a contour. Uh, elderberries are well known for their ability to hold the soil and prevent erosion. And with that being said, she grew her elderberries down the hill. Just like um, her thinking yeah. was, yeah, started up the top of the hill and ran the elderberry rows right down the hill, <laughs> which is completely contrary. You would think you would be creating a place and a path for water and it would create erosion. Right. Her theory was that she could run her trunk line for her irrigation at the top of the hill and then gravity feed downhill to all the rows. Sure. It works beautifully. Wow. It works she beautiful. hasn't even stepped it down as she goes. Does, no, it's not stepped. It's not terrace. She just literally ran, and this is a pretty good hill. She yeah. probably has a six to seven percent grade. Oh man, is that is you she? Know, we're talking about the hill going down Black Mountain. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big hill. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay, so you can grow it on a level plane, or you can grow it on a slope. Right. The one thing about elderberry, and I mentioned this earlier about the plastic. If it's too robust, that forces the primocanes out. So you don't want to do that. Elderberries love a really cool, moist soil environment. And the way we can replicate that is through mulch. Mm -hmm. Mulch also is going to help with weed control and make whatever weeds you have much easier to get out. Right. The other thing about a mulched uh, environment with plants growing in it with those root systems right there near the surface, that also helps hold for erosion. So with that, the caveat on this land that she does, she does a tremendous job mulching. The big advantage of having the cover grasses in between in your alleys is you literally take your discharge shoot and, shoot, and as you mow the alleys in between, you're literally working hard to spray those clippings right onto the elderberry. Yeah. And so we have things like, you know, our nitrogen fixing legumes. And so you're literally creating a nitrogen rich environment for those elderberries by putting those clippings on there, by putting the minerals into the soil, the agricultural charcoal into the soil, organic, you know, poultry manure, you know, you can buy pelleted poultry manure to, to put in there for a good organic fertilizer. So now those grasses are really, really robust. They're very healthy. The microorganisms are doing their part to create more new soil. And again, you know, the, all that's going back to help feed the elderberries. And with elderberries, and like so many things, you know, you get what you put in. You get out what you put in. So the healthier the soil is, the more nutritious the soil is in and around the elderberries, that telegraphs through to a more nutritious berry as well. Okay, okay so Are what? You, uh, have, have you seen it, uh, these grown in a hugel culture type bed? And what type of culture? Hugel culture. It's, it's the old European method of digging a pit, laying in logs, and then stacking up on top of that branches, twigs, and then layers of soil and soil amendment. So you're duplicating what happens essentially. I think that's wonderful. Um, I think if you're going to try to do that all across two acres, oh, wow, yeah. you're, oh, yeah. you're going to work hard, Coleman. You're yeah. going to have a lot of wood. To go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. But that could be something someone could do in their home. On a home. small scale, maybe. Yeah, in their on a small home. scale for a backyard gardener, that's an excellent idea. For a commercial gardener, you know, a commercial aspect, people like to use equipment to yeah. defer a lot of those labor costs, you know, and that's why you're yeah. going to be using a broadcast spreader and potentially, you know, a, a rotary more that's uh, either pull behind or something like that to help with that thing. It's not to say you can't do it with walk behind equipment, you know, a garden tiller and a push more. You can, but again, you know, if you start thinking acreage, yeah, you can get away with that with a half an acre. 
Yeah. But you start looking at five to 10 acres, you know, the, the garden tiller and the push more suddenly become a little more work than I want to do. Especially on the slope. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, before I forget, um, I meant to go back to the question um, that some of our audience has had about elderberries. So we touched on the one about uh, edibility um, and how it's not recommended to eat even the Sambucus nigra um, raw, except unless you're just juicing them, basically masticating and juicing them without and then spitting out the seeds. Um, however we can cook them so that was the main question the other one though is people are having problems with birds it's like they're so excited about the elderberries uh the, the berries start to come and in some cases even the flowers and they go out to find them all gone and demolished if you're in a field you know and you've got a crop growing how do you how do you manage that is it under net well Elderberries are the favorite amongst birds and other mammals. Um, most of our critters on the planet know how to self-medicate. They certainly know how to feed themselves. Um, <laughs> with that being said, the big advantage with elderberries is they are not ripe during those migratory times of the birds where you can have giant flocks come in and literally glean everything. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, you will have some selective bird predation of your elderberries. And if all you have is one clump in your backyard, there is a good chance in a neighborhood where everybody's feeding the birds that you could have a total crop loss. However, when you get out into a larger situation and the rows are 600 or 1,000 feet long and you literally have acres, there's not enough birds in that local population to eat all those berries. So really the best way to avoid that is a good stand of elderberries. We don't want to keep the wild population from the fruit and the berries and the things we grow. Yeah. Again, the wildlife population is a measure of a healthy ecosystem. We absolutely want a healthy wildlife population. So much in fact that every 10th row is a wildlife planting and we put mulberry and pecan and oh. raspberry and hazelnut and wild plum and mulberry and chestnut and we put those things in that row and we grow that for the wildlife nice. oh that's sweet love that yeah yeah and do you that's do that approach. do you tend to do that on the perimeter or are you just doing that somewhere in the middle of we your do that throughout the orchard in fact we even go through our orchard and we plant those same tree species within the rows of elderberries yeah. with the idea that the pecan tree is going to live for 400 or more years. But a pecan tree gets spaced out on 50 foot centers with no more than about 25 to 45 per acre. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, the elderberries are going to produce for 15 full years before you get your first single pecan. Wow. So the idea, again, you know, we talked about how this farm, you know, and part of what we were trying to do was restore the farm to create uh, an opportunity for the land to heal from being overused, both for cattle and agriculturally. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did was we planted an entire hillside, a 40 acre hillside with walnut. So my father literally taught me the value of a hundred year plan when I was only 14 years old. He told me that these trees will not be for you. I looked at him, I didn't know what he was talking about. He goes, these, these trees are gonna be for my grandchildren. Yeah. I still didn't know what he was talking about, I'm only 14. He says, you know, one day, son, you're gonna grow up and you're gonna fall in love and you're gonna get married and you'll have children. These, these seeds that we're planting today are gonna to be for those children. Mm -hmm. I still looked at him kind of baffled. <laughs> then he held his hand up like a pizza pan, you know, about that big, and he said, it takes 80 to 100 years to produce a walnut log big enough for lumber. So if we want walnut lumber in a hundred years, we have to plant these, these seeds today. Wow. So with our, with that in mind, with our farm, yeah, we're growing elderberries, you know, it's like, what do you do elderberries? But that's not why we grow elderberries. <laughs> There's a lot bigger picture to the why here. We're yeah. doing this to basically restore the garden to give me an opportunity to save the family farm, to give me a platform to be able to speak to people on how they can better care for their land and the planet. You know, so there's a real big picture of this. Yeah, the Norms Farms is a product business. It was designed to celebrate my father's life, and we named him and named our product business in his honor. However, he had nothing to do with that other than the naming of it. He was alive long enough 
to actually see his logo, trans his image transformed as a logo for us and to see his name, you know, in, in, in print, you know, in the form of a logo. So he got to be that part of it. But, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, overall, the big picture is much larger than, yeah, we sell an elderberry product line. Definitely. Yeah. That's an excellent. Fantastic. That's an excellent um, almost conclusion to this second part, um, except that just to wrap up with um, if and actually almost introduce part three, and that is so we want to talk about the people who are interested in considering growing elderberries for uh, a living even. Um, maybe we can con conclude this section with you said that you found that other farmers that you were selling the cuttings to to were doing a better job of growing them than you were. So now you basically source the cuttings. So you're still growing the elderberry, you source the cuttings, and then you create market products, um, added value products. And so I guess some of your growers are sell selling the elderberries back to you, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so it's a, far, it's a wonderful, you know, basically all that cycle. you're describing, yeah, it's a nice, a wonderful cycle of nature, essentially, and, you know, kind of an integrative kind of thing that makes a lot of sense so like a permaculture um, business ecosystem you know sustainable business is what i'm looking for is the word i'm looking for um so we want to kind of conclude this section with how much land someone would need if they decide that they want to if they if their vision is to end up growing elderberry uh, enough to sustain a family of four for instance as a farmer well that's a difficult question to answer because everybody's skill set and their equipment is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no magic bullet, you know, one size fits all. My recommendation for people who are considering to grow elderberries is to start small and try it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reason I recommend that they start small and try it is to find out a how well the elderberries are going to grow for them in their geographic location. B, to find out if it's something that they even want to do. Yeah. And we call that a small bet. So before you make a large bet and go out and buy enough cuttings to plant five or 10 acres, my recommendation, start with a thousand cuttings. That's where the price break is. You save a thousand dollars on that. That's going to give you enough to plant a half an acre. Give it a try. I recommend using more than one variety to find out which variety is going to do best for you and then grow those out. That's going to do two things. It's going to tell you the A and B answers that you need to know to find out if you really want to make a much bigger vet. The other thing is, is it allows you to establish your own nursery. As much as I would love to sell you 10,000 cuttings at once, um, I'd rather not. I'd rather sell you 1,000 and have you work it and be successful and keep your costs down. Grow your own stock and not buy all those from me. You know, again, this is all about wealth for the farmer. You know, you don't want to give all your money to me. Give, give me just enough to get you started and enough to give me enough interest to support you. Yeah. You know, if you're not going to buy a thousand cuttings, I'm probably not going to give you as much support. But if you actually say, hey, you know, Raj, I put these thousand cuttings. It looks like it's going good for me. I think there's going to be some potential. You know, I may want to put out five acres. Well, then I'm going to be even more serious about talking to you about buying them. When we buy them, this is not for everybody. We need a couple things have to be met. You know, quality assurance is paramount. So when we buy those berries from you, we want all ripe berries. I won't tolerate less than about two to three percent red and green berries in that in that brew. I also don't want a bunch of insects in there. I don't want any micro stems. I want my berries to be clean and in a commodity state. So they need to be weighed out in food grade storage containers, whether that be a plastic pail, food grade plastic pail, or a cardboard box with a liner in it. And then those have to be put onto a pallet. That's all gotta be shrunk wrapped. And I gotta be able to get to your property with a semi truck. In other words, a truck with a freezer on it because these berries can never thaw out until I get ready to make them. So it's not for the faint of heart. You know, a lot of people like want to grow and they're like, well, yeah, I've grown all these elderberries and I'm like, and they live at the end of a, you know, a dead end rural gravel road. It's like, how can I get those berries from you? Well, I said, well, we put them in Ziploc bags. Oh no. Yeah. I can't deal with, you know, 1500 pounds of 
frozen berries in a Ziploc bag that I know no quality about. So while there's that opportunity for people to do these things and to be a grower in our network, certain requirements do have to be met. I wouldn't dissuade a, a grower from getting started to grow elderberry because elderberries are valuable to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You can make your own value added product. Nobody's really making elderberry wine on any scale. Mm -hmm. I get people all the time want to buy frozen elderberries from me in small quantities. I have no way to be able to deal with that. My pallet weighs 1,500 pounds of elderberries on a pallet. I can't break a pallet and sell somebody 20 pounds. Wow. You know, if you no, I can't sell that whole pallet. Plus, I have no way to deal with the frozen transport of that small quantity. So if somebody wanted to get into the small sale, we do sell those berries. Um, when we purchase berries, we buy them at around $2 a pound. I sell berries sometimes to a couple select small resellers in 100-pound quantities, but they meet me with their, with their own frozen truck. And then I, in turn, sell those to them for $5 a pound. And then they parse those out to small quantities. we got a guy who sells all sorts of mycology products, mushrooms. And so he's selling to restaurants, and he buys elderberries from me. And then he turns around and sells them to three to five pound quantities, and he gets $12 a pound for them. Wow. wow. So while that market is there, you know, and I don't dissuade you from getting started, it may be that you're not the right grower for me, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider growing elderberries either to create your own value added product line pies. As an example, we get people all the time want to make elderberry pies. You can't buy a frozen ready to bake elderberry pie anywhere yeah. or elderberry pie filling. Somebody said they wanted to make that as a value added product. Nobody's making an elderberry pancake syrup yet. I mean, there's just a thousand things that can be done with the elderberries. Can elderberries be uh, flash frozen, like freeze dried, and uh, or just regular dried? They absolutely can. Uh, dried elderberries is a pretty good market out there uh, to buy the dried elderberries, either through Mountain Rose Herbs, Frontier Herbs. We're actually working on our own line of dehydrated elderberries. We've got a commercial dehydrator that we're starting to play with last year. Mm -hmm. um, just played with it this year. We look like we're going to possibly be able to set aside maybe as much as a, you know, a half a ton in the dried elderberry world. Wow. Um, the other thing that elderberry is extremely valuable for is as a pigment. So getting back to that freeze dried elderberry, that, el that freeze dried elderberry can be powdered. And then that powder can then be in turn used in things like dietary supplements, uh, colorant, uh, for beverages. Um, it can be used as dye. I mean, one of the things that they use elderberry for and was prominent in this country for a long time was for a grade stamp on meat. And you may have actually seen that. You know, we're old enough that our memory goes back when we would actually see a stamp on the outside of the cow that was in purple. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Yep, sure. That was elderberry, just straight elderberry ink. It was elderberry juice is what it was. It's nice wow. to know it was edible. <laughs> yeah, now now most of that most of that grade stamp is going to a soy based ink, but it used to be just straight elderberry juice. Fascinating. Yeah. Definitely. yeah so there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, the flowers are extremely valuable. There's a liqueur made from the flowers called Saint Germain. I don't know if you guys know that one. Yeah. No? Tell us. Yeah. Third year in business, he had sixteen million dollars in sales based on the elder flower. Wow. In year number four, the company sold for about $100 million to an international distillery. Good wow. night. <laughs> so, the, the, so the flower yeah. blossom, and what were they doing with that? They would distill that flower down and mix it with like a fortified wine to create a liqueur. Okay. Uh, we have a process that we do that we make our elderflower syrup. The recipe is on the website. If anybody is interested in learning how to make their own elderflower syrup, we have not only that recipe, but gosh, at least 40 or 50 other recipes, everything from desserts, um, you know, entrees, main course, side dishes, salad dressings, um, cocktail mixtures. Yeah. So there's a ton of cool things one can do with the elderberry once you've got it, you know, broken down into its major components. Our wellness syrup is a combination of the 
elderberry extract with honey, cinnamon, and cloves added. It does a great job helping to uh, ease the discomforts of sore throats. That and sounds wonderful. Discomfort. Roger, let's talk about your products, all of them, in just a minute. Let's go okay. to this section by, you mentioned, I, I love that you're offering ideas to other people of products that they can make from the elderberry, even though they might at some point be in competition with you. Um, that just speaks to the generosity of your spirits. But what is it about, um, are you guys not currently making the elderberry syrup or wine, for instance, because you just haven't gotten to it or you're not interested in doing those? Well, <laughs> good question. that's a really good question. It's complicated and expensive to create a product. Yes. Um, as an example, a label design by a professional designer to create a label can be 1500 to $2,000, right? The other thing is, is you have to do the nutritional set testing to find out if it's going to be a product. So we rely heavily on NC State and the food science department to do all of our nutritional and supplement testing. Nice. So each time we do a product that can run upwards of a thousand dollars. We often also have to do what's known as shelf set testing. In other words, we need to determine the shelf life of a product. So all that has to be done. And I know this is all really boring and I'm not trying to, dissuade anybody from doing these things because it's a great way to create value added out of whatever it is you grow, whether you're growing grapes or mm -hmm. brambles or fruits or, you know, stuff to make relishes and chow chows. It's a great way to preserve your farm crop, mm -hmm. you know, for sale later. So I don't dissuade you from doing that, but it is complicated. And a lot of farmers don't want to go through that process of creating a label, developing a brand, finding stores to sell it for them or finding a retail purchaser of their product. They generally like a, what's known as a farm gate price. They want to know before they start, how much is this product that I'm growing, this, this agricultural thing, what's it worth, right? They want to know because they want to plan. Okay, I'm thinking I might get four or five, 6,000 pounds for the acre. What are you going to pay for? Out the gate. And then that way that telegraphs through to a number that they can start to manage by. Again, you know, the whole thing about wealth for the farmer, we, we want you guys to make money at this. If you're not going to make money at it, A, you're going to stop doing it, or B, totally will go into competition with me. Yeah. I'm aware of that. Yeah. But our motto is elderberry for everybody every day, just like the family that started the palm and brought pomegranate to the consumer in a way that we now know it. Pomegranate was a novel fruit. It sat in your basket on your table. People looked at it. It was pretty. But, oh, my God, did you ever try to eat a pomegranate? Yeah. 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 You yeah. tried it every once in a while. But, you know, it wasn't something like you're going to buy a lot of it. Well, this family planted 18,000 acres of Palm Wonderful in California, wow. thus the name Palm One. Yeah. They're the single largest landowner, private landowner in the state of California. This family is, a, they're billionaires. Wow. So they have done for the pomegranate what we want to do for the elderberry. Not that I'm a billionaire or anything. I don't hardly have any money at all. I just got a lot of good ideas. <laughs> but the idea is to bring elderberry right to the consumer, just like we think of pomegranate or cranberry or orange juice for that matter. You know, orange juice used to be a novel fruit too that they gave away for Christmas in places like Boston and New York City. Yeah. It wasn't something that was on everybody's table every day. Yeah. So if we can do that for the elderberry, it's gonna take thousands of us. Yeah. Elderberry for everybody every day. Yeah. Thousands of us, a lot of farmers, a lot of value added producers, a lot of product ideas. And I recognize that I can't do this by myself, nor do I want to. Right. I believe in cooperation, collaboration, and I've even coined what I call open source farming. You know, you heard about open source software and open source coding. Cool. Farmers are a great group of people. They love to collaborate and share. And I'm excited to be a part of that community. And, you know, this, this business that we have, this product business, we're growing this business synergistically with our farmers. We can't grow our product business faster than we have the supply chain in order to support it. Absolutely. So speaking yeah, we can't put our product out on the shelf knowing that maybe there's going to be a void. If you lose your space on the shelf, you'll never get it back. Yeah, that's mm. really tough. That's really tough. So um, this is really coming to a close on this. And, but, and I'd like to close with um, talking about briefly 
I was so surprised to discover, I think on your side I read it, that about 90% of the elderberry purchased in the U.S. is imported from Europe. Is that correct? That's right. I know. Isn't that surprising? Yeah. Well, another interesting fact is the U.S. is the world's table. In other words, we are the consumers of elderberry. 60% of the world's elderberry crop is consumed here in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. 90% of what Americans consume, like you said, they do come either from Europe as a direct finished product. And so we have products with the name Sambucol, Sambutussin, Sambugard. So that's because of the genus, Sambucus. So if you see Sambu as a prefix in front of any product, it means it's elderberry. So these are all finished goods coming directly from Europe. We also have great American companies like Gaia Herbs based right here in Brevard, North Carolina. Wonderful company. I've met with John before and tried to get him to use our Native American elderberry extract. He can't do it. His product is actually manufactured in Italy and right on the side of the box it says it's a product of Italy. Wow. So all their documentation marketing is all based on this Sambucus Nigra. And why can't they? Uh, buy local because he would have to relabel everything all the studies that they've done and they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars would all have to be redone with the canadensis so not only would they have to redo all those studies they'd have to come up with a new package new labeling new oh my god yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing the other thing that's really really important to note there's a big difference between the norms farms product line and what you buy on the shelf as a finished goods from Europe. In Europe, they have very rigorous standards and they will actually tell you on the side of the box, there are so many milligram units of elderberry per serving in that container. The way that is done is you start out with a powdered elderberry and that gets back to Coleman's question. The majority of the elderberries grown in Europe are grown in Austria through the Styrian Berry Cooperative. All those berries that are grown goes to one buyer and that is turned into powdered elderberry. Wow. Wow. Yes. 600 metric tons of elderberry every year gets turned into powder. So with that in mind, these products start with powder. They work out a measured weight in milligrams of that powder. They reconstitute it with another measured amount of water. They thicken it with another measured amount of glycerin to thicken it, and then they sweeten it because the stuff tastes awful, and they sweeten it with something like licorice concentrate, which is 30 times sweeter than sugar, so you don't even have to put that on the, on the box. So while the efficacy of those products are good, the consumer doesn't have to worry. They're very safe. They really do work. It's way different than what we do. What we do is a slow process, low temperature aqueous process, very similar to the way grandma would have made it. So we're extending the life of that product through a hot pack canning process. So it's literally just like what grandma would have made. Right. So there's a huge difference between our product and what the consumer would buy as a European finished product. The other thing that we see in this country is they actually will import elderberry concentrate and that comes in at a bricks of about 68. And then when a product is made from that, like uh, Wildwood Cellars in Kansas, as an example, they simply reconstitute that with more water to create their elderberry product. But they also rebottle the concentrate straight from the barrel into a bottle that they also sell as an elderberry concentrate. So it's a 100% European hmm except that it's bottled in Kansas. It would seem, have you had a chance to evaluate the uh, nutritive quality of yours in, through your process versus the reconstituted powdered syrup, for instance? Well, we haven't done so personally. The University of Missouri applied for an NIH block grant, uh, $7.1 million a year over five years. So they got about $35.5 million grant to study the efficacy of the elderberry, not only the historical claims, but medical claims as well. And so they are releasing a lot of that stuff right now, and they're finding out 
that there is a lot of good evidence to, to support some of these claims. The Israelis have done a lot of studies for antiviral and anti-flu properties of the elderberry, finding that it's more effective than any of the, the uh, flu shots. It's not only effective, more effective than flu shots, it's effective across the whole spectrum of viruses and does actually inhibit those viruses' ability to replicate. The University of Missouri in the lab actually isolated how and why they believe, they don't know for certain, why it is so effective at helping to block and eliminate the flu virus. When the flu virus actually enters through the cell wall through electron microscopy, they can actually watch this happen. The cell wall literally lights up like it's been struck by a bolt of lightning, known as a cytokine response. And what they found by exposing the virus to elderberry, not only does it inhibit the virus's ability to replicate, it also is found to block the cytokine response. Wow. Whoa. Pretty amazing. So it's actually being backed up by some scientific evidence that this is not just ancient wisdom, that this is not just folklore, that there is actually some science behind it that does support it. Totally. So. Yeah. Pretty fascinating. Totally. And so um, the next short video, we're going to talk about your product. Well, and maybe a little, because we want to go into a little bit more on why you chose those, but to give almost like a preview of each of the things that you have. But let's close this section with the mottos that you said, elderberry for every day, right? Elderberry for everybody. Every everybody. Day. Every, every, day. every Elderberry for everybody every day. Um, and then the other one is wealth for the farmer and health for the community. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Normsfarms.com, everybody. This is gardensall.com. We're here with Roger Lenhart, Coleman Alderson, Leora, Leora Alderson. Messed up my own name. Okay. We'll go on to, to part three in a second. <laughs>